You are watching the online broadcast of the New Progress Missionary Baptist Church in Tampa, Florida. We are the Church of Power, Purpose, and Progress, where the Reverend Maurice D. Taylor is pastor. You may view our services on Facebook and on YouTube. We also urge you to visit our website, www.newprogressmbca.com, where you will find certain details on our ministries and contact information as well as ways to give and to request prayer. We invite you to stay tuned for our prayer. Our Father, who art heaven, holy be God name, thou kingdom come, thou be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Emmanuel, we worship you. What a beautiful song. I stand before you to give you the announcements for this coming week. We first would like to welcome everyone to worship with us today. Amen. And do we have any first-time visitors? If we do, can you just raise your hand? Everyone is in the house. Thank God. Let's keep our prayers and thoughts with the, our sick and shut-in members and keep them lifted up in prayer. And we also want to keep Sister Bachelor lifted up in prayer as she has lost her daughter. So let's keep her lifted up in prayer also. And also reach out to her if you can during this time. With that being said, we're going to move on to our birthdays. Uh, we have a birthday, Sister Shirley Strange. She will, I don't see her, but she will be celebrating her birthday on the 16th. Um, so let's just throw our arms around her and tell her happy birthday when we see her. Or if she's watching on um, social media, Facebook, happy birthday to you. And we also would like to say happy anniversary to Reverend Davis and his wife for celebrating 43 years of marriage. Congratulations. <laughs> God is awesome. <laughs> and we have some general announcements. Um, please bring your children out for Children's Church each Sunday. And remember, we have Sunday school with Sister Sheila leading the class. And also, I would like to say that you can give $3 per month for the youth in support of our youth ministry, if you would like. This is to help our ministry. And you can place it in, a, in your tithing envelope and just put the youth ministry on there. Um, we're not going to limit those $3, but <laughs> if you will, you give as your heart desire. <laughs> and moving on, we would like to thank the evangel evangelism ministry for hosting their event yesterday at Rolette Park. Yeah. We want to thank everyone for participation and support. Um, it was nice. I went out there and I enjoyed myself. I'm not a part of the evangelism, evangelism ministry, but it was really nice to go out there and then, you know, just to see people come up um, that was just in the park, not a part of like, different pavilions. People just walking through the park and their ex them extending their support and um, showing their love, passing out um, all of the information that they have and just being a part of what they were doing. It was beautiful, I must say. Um, they had on their purple shirts. Uh, it was just beautiful. I, I had a good time Amen. and the weather was great. Amen. So I had a good time. I, I encourage you all to just join them, stop by the next one that they have. It was really nice. And on the fourth Sunday, please bring your walking shoes to join us as we will go witnessing in the neighborhood for our 1030 service. After following our 1030 service, okay. Let me not get that piece. <laughs> we will go witnessing in the neighborhood following our 1030 service. Uh, William Course will have rehearsal at 6.30 p.m. Monday, Monday and deacons and William Course minister, William Course please stay after service for a short meeting with Deacon Williams. This will conclude our announcements and you all have a blessed day.
Colossians, third chapter, verses 12 through 13. Colossians, third chapter, 12 to 13. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. May God add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and most of all, the doers of his holy word. Thank you for bringing us, waking us up this morning and bringing us here safely. Thank you. Help the sick, help the ones that have mental problems, help the ones that have problems that no one knows about. Talk with them, have them have guidance to come to you. Amen.
got a middle part. Jesus loved me. Yes, he loved me. Jesus loved me. I'm so glad he loved me. Jesus loved me. Jesus loved me. Jesus loved me. I'm so glad he loved me. Jesus loved me. Jesus loved me. Jesus loved me. I'm so glad he loved me. Jesus loved me. Jesus loved me. Jesus loved me. For the Bible. B-L-E That's the book for me Good morning, New Progress. Good morning. Today is Youth Sunday. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And uh, this morning... Pastor Taylor wanted me to give a message that was primarily directed towards the parents, Amen. the caregivers of our youth. But before we do that, I do want to direct my attention to you young people in the back. Amen. There's a word from you this morning from the Lord. That's all right. So as we begin this morning, if you would please turn with me in your Bible into the New Testament, book of Ephesians. 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, and when you have it, would you please rise to your feet? Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, and when you have it and you are able, please rise to your feet for the reading of the word of God. And it reads as follows, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, My Lord. but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. May the Lord add a blessing to those who read here and do his word. You may be seated. Amen. On this morning, I'm going to be preaching on this wise three pillars of parenting. Three pillars yeah. of parenting. You see, families determine the future, making parenting one of the most critical tasks on earth. Amen. Unfortunately, today, Satan has been, done a great job of dismantling the family. Amen? Amen. Satan, <clears throat> despite the pain... knows what God's plan is, and he's trying to disrupt it. He understands that God's plan for the family was that through the family, the earth would be blessed. Not only that, but Satan has also been after the family since the beginning of time. If you recall from the book of Genesis, you notice he never bothered Adam until Adam got married. By the way, again, uh, thank you all for recognizing the fact that I've uh, been able to survive 43 years of marriage to my wife, Jackie. She hadn't gotten rid of me yet. <laughs> but I've got to tell you, it's only been by the grace of God. But Satan is not just after a man. You need to understand what Satan is after is a future. Satan wants your children because he wants to control tomorrow by advancing a culture of rebellion against God. But let me stop here for a second because I want you young people to know what God's word has to say about you. Psalm 127 verses 3 and 4 reads as follow. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward like the arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children's of one's youth. Please know that God considers you a heritage, a blessing to your parents. Now, I want us to get something straight here. You know, back in the day, there used to be this thing called uh, illegitimate children. You, you, you all remember that? We used to say if you were born out of wedlock, you were somehow illegitimate. I want to put and dispel and put that to rest. There are no such thing as illegitimate children. Because if God purposed for them to be here, they're legitimate and they're here because he determined them to be here. So whether or not you plan to have them, all right, whether they were an accident, no matter how they got here, they're here because God determined them to do so. Psalms 139 says it this way, young people. In Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14, and following in verse 16, it says it this way. This is what God did. He formed your inward parts. He covered you in your mother's womb. And the psalmist David says something, and you young people ought to say this also. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Marvelous are, are your works, and that my soul knows very well. You're fearfully, you're wonderfully made. God determined you to be here. Verse 16 says it this way. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they are, were all written, the days fashioned for me. When as yet, there were none of them. Young people, you are not an accident. Young people, you have to understand God knew you even before your conception and birth. You got to understand he's already numbered the number of days you're going to live here on the earth. And as long as you are living in obedience to him, you're not going to leave here any sooner until what he has for you has been accomplished in your life. That's a word for you young people. But since this message is mainly for the parents this morning, I want us to understand what was God looking for in a family. You see, in the last Old Testament book of Malachi, the prophet in chapter 2, verse 15, said what God was after. What God was after was a godly seed. In other words, children born into this world who would live to bring glory and honor to him in obedience to his word, representing his interests here in the world. That's what he was looking for. That was supposed to be happening through the children of Israel. But we all know from the record that Israel failed. They abandoned the godly covenant. They went their own way in rebellion against God. And therefore, God sends them into exile eventually to be dispersed throughout the whole world. So what does God have to say to us, parents? He has instructed us in his word concerning three pillars of parenting, which, if followed, it could stabilize and protect your home as well as future generations from the attacks of the enemy. You see, raising God-fearing, Christ-following, what I would call kingdom kids, involves carrying out each of these three important pillars on a regular basis. So there are three things I want to leave with you all today. First is encouragement. Second is discipline. And third is instruction. Doing so helps to establish a strong family with consistent expectations and follow through. Encouragement. We learn about our first pillar through the words of Paul when he wrote what will serve as our primary verse for our sermon this morning, once again, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4. And once again, Paul reiterated the same concept in his letter to the church at Colossae when he wrote, fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart, Colossians 3, 21. Yet before we dive into this area of encouragement, I want to point out that both <clears throat> in, in both verses, Paul used the Greek word that has been translated into fathers. It applies to the male parent primarily, but can also express both parents in its application. The same Greek word is used in Hebrews 11.23 when talking about Moses' mother and father, and it is often translated as parents. And in choosing that term, Paul was not limiting the pillar of parenting to just the man. These verses could have just as easily been translated, parents, do not exasperate your children, or parents, do not provoke your children to anger. I also want to point out what 
this verse could not be translated to read. They could not have been translated as government. Do not exasperate your children. Or village. Do not exasperate your children. Or school system. Do not provoke your children to anger. This is because the responsibility of raising Christian kids is on the parents. It is on you and me, not the government or even our schools. A child needs parents to raise him or her well, not a village. Now, I know that that is a popular thing you hear said, but let me explain where I'm coming from. Unless the village has biblical values, unless it's based on what God says in his word, that village will mess that person up. Gangs are villages. Amen? Entertainment is a village as well. In fact, entertainment is the most prevalent village raising kids in our nation today. The average child, think about this, spends 32 more hours a week in front of a television, a tablet, right? Gaming devices or other forms of electronic media. Look, we don't need any more villages running kids, raising kids. Amen? We need more parents raising kingdom kids. So understand, it is the parents' responsibility to raise their children well. And one of the first ways to do this is by not exasperating them. This means that parents are not to provoke their children. They are not to create irritation, anger, frustration in the lives of their children. We can easily turn this verse around and say that rather than discouraging them, parents are to encourage their children. Scripture tells us in Proverbs 18.21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. A parent who discourages his or her children instead of encouraging them, there is a difference between discouragement and encouragement. Between encouragement and praise, though, we need to understand, praise for what our children have done is important. But children need more than just the encouragement and the praise for what they've done, they need to be encouraged, most importantly, for who they are. Encouragement relates to their identity in Christ and their inheritance as an image bearer of God. They're children of the king. That's who they are. We need to encourage them in that because that's most important. Because all of us can't do all great things all the time. Amen? Amen. And some of the time, the mistakes that we make is, well, my kid hadn't done anything of any significance. You know, he's not on honor roll. You know, he's not uh, a star on the sports team and, and all of this kind of stuff. And so he never hears any encouragement about the fact that, you know what, I'm just glad you're here and you're my child and I love you because God gifted you to me. Encouragement. Have you ever seen a drooping plant quickly perk up when someone pours some water on it? That's what encouragement does. Encouragement will take a droopy kid and perk him up again. As the Bible tells us from Proverbs 16, 24, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. So encouraging your children gives them an expectation of God's goodness and favor on both their todays and their tomorrows. It sets within their hearts an anticipation of a glorious future. Encouragement tells them that they are fearfully and wonderfully made and have been gifted by God. It helps them to believe that God has a plan for them filled with both a future and a hope. One reason so many teenagers get caught up with the negative groups 
of their peers today is because that is where their encouragement many times is found. They get more affirmation from their peers than from their parents. And so they respond to what makes them feel significant. Look, parents, let, let your words reach deep down into your children's heart with encouragement and with truth that communicates to them that, first of all, you know your children. You know, a lot of times what frustrates kids is that they don't feel they're really being heard. They, they don't sense that mom, dad, grandma, granddad, auntie, uncle, foster parent, guardian, whoever is over those kids, you're not, you don't know me. You keep saying things and doing things that, that hurt me, but you don't seem to notice or care. You got to know their personalities. You need to understand what their dreams are, what their, their hopes, their struggles. And to help them understand that, look, it'll turn out okay because of who they are and to whom they belong. Give them the hope that they need to face each day. Now, on top of that, do not promote your children to anger. As Paul said, provoking them can happen by disrespecting them with your words and actions. Once again, how many times, you know, a lot of kids, they react because you don't treat them with the dignity that is due the fact of who they are in God and in Christ. Yes, they may be an immature, bad-behaving kid, but you still need to treat them with dignity. You need to still recognize that they are a person of worth in the eyes of God, even though they might be getting on your last nerve. Now, I know that's none of y'all kids, right? But you got to do that. Things like comparing them to others. Or showing favoritism to one child over another. Now, we all remember the story that happened in Genesis with Joseph. What his brothers did when his father showed favoritism by giving him that, that multicolored coat. You remember that? Look, the bottom line is be fair with your treatment of your children. Be fair in terms of the time that you give them and the attention you give them because your children are equally valuable, all equally valuable to your Father in heaven. Being critical, finding fault, and setting up your children with negative faults about the future can also develop in them a spirit of frustration. These things have a profound effect on children more than we might even know or realize so always be mindful whether you are speaking life to them or discouraging them with your words and your actions now you know I've been a parent or still a parent but <laughs> I know there are some times <laughs> right when it may not feel very easy to encourage I, I understand, I get it, but you know I've come to recognize, given the mistakes that I've made, we've made, that those are the times that you really kind of need to dig deep and find the patience and the commitment required. Part of parenting is connecting with your child with a healthy esteem, a healthy sense of their value, that they're highly regarded. You've got to relate to them in such a way that they sense that from you regarding how you feel about them. Some kids are born with a strong self-esteem. You don't need to build them up. They're going to tell you how good they are. <laughs> Amen? But you know, some of those other children, they're very shy. They're very, very fragile. The, 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 the slightest 
you know, meanness in your voice or disrespect can just break them down, right? You all know that. You've been there. As a parent, you must be committed to walk with each child as he or she discovers her personal identity and esteem. You've got to help them to get grounded in valuing themselves for who they are because they are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. He has a plan for their life. He regards them highly. He's going to use them to advance his kingdom. And you have to instill in that child that because God has made them, he is valuable in his sight and therefore in yours. The next thing we have after encouragement is this area of discipline. Pillar number two, Paul writes, once again, it is in the second part of Ephesians 6, 4, where he says, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Discipline involves a number of things. It is not only a corrective influence on a child's life, but it also involves instilling in them personal discipline with his, his or her life. Now, we understand as we go through life that discipline is a key factor if we're going to have a victorious Christian life, whether it is the discipline of money management. How about how we utilize and spend our time, what we prioritize the use of our time for. And, of course, we all know personal morality. Get that wrong, and it messes up a whole bunch of things in life. Amen? Job, in the Old Testament, wrote during his distress that he had disciplined his eyes so as not to lust on a woman. I have made a covenant with my eyes, according to Job 31.1. And Paul in the New Testament spoke of the discipline he had maintained so that he would finish his race strong. He says, I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. 1 Corinthians 9.27. So parental discipline, when it's done well, trains your child to apply personal discipline. That is the ability to discipline themselves, to control themselves as they grow older, and it also prevents them from making poor decisions later in their life. Example that I found very interesting was uh, the parents of the great missionary to China during the 1800s. There's a person called Hudson Taylor. He was a great missionary to China during the 1800s. And his parents strove to teach him personal discipline by putting a piece of dessert on the table in front of his evening meal and then giving him the option of not eating it because he trusted them for a greater reward later. Now, you know how tough that must have been. You stick a piece of cake or candy in front of these kids and ask them to try not to eat it. <laughs> Look, you know, there are some kids you can... You can throw some food in the air, and now have it eaten before it hits the floor. But his parents were after something. And this is what we should be after when we train our kids. Teach them the benefit of delayed gratification. One of the things that messes so many of us is that we never learned early to say no to that which we wanted for the benefit of being able to say yes to a better reward later. And so we, 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 we grab for what we can get now and we miss out on the greater thing later. We've all been there, have we not? 
And in the case of Hudson Taylor, in this way, he had the option to eat it. But here's what he knew. If he chose not to eat it, he also received a greater reward of two things. He got his parents' affirmation for his ability to discipline himself not to eat right now. And on top of that, he got this greater treat. Now, the reward of the parents' affirmation seemed to stick with him more than the, the, the additional treat. You, you tend to forget that stuff, right? As soon as you get your belly full, then, you know, that cake cookie doesn't really mean that much. But, but the parents' affirmation, telling that they were proud of their son for, for holding off, that stuck with him, and it made a very strong impression on his life. You see, he said that this affirmation, even more so than the greater reward later, was a critical learning opportunity for him as a child. Not only that, but it also later informed and transfer, transferred into his adult life. Now, when he had to make some choices, when the stakes were a whole lot bigger, he was in a position now, what? Having been trained to exercise that self-discipline, that delayed gratification, he was able to delay the rewards of immediate gratification for an even deeper, more meaningful and lasting reward from his heavenly father. And because of that, he had a positive impact on the nation of China for the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason there are Christians in China, even to this day, in the midst of that communist state, is because in the 1800s, he committed himself to the Lord, and many Chinese were saved even to this day. Now, there are also corrective measures a parent must apply to raise kingdom kids. Essentially, we need to understand something. Your children are born with hell in them. Now, I know that sounds hard. Them little baby girls of mine, they, they can, you know, wrap me around their little fingers and, you know, they can get Pop Pop to do anything for them, but I have to remind myself they're little sinners. They were born with a sin nature. David in Psalms 51 said, I was conceived in sin even in my mother's womb. We were all born in sin. We were all born into the kingdom of, of Satan until we get saved. That applies to our beautiful children. And it is our job to correct and train them so that when they are saved, when they are coming to an age of accountability, where they hear the gospel, and then they believe it, and they can choose to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and then the Holy Spirit indwells them, what then happens is that the dominant influence in their lives is the Holy Spirit that will convict them of sin will motivate them to be obey, to obey you. Not your hollering at them, screaming at them, shouting at them, telling them to be quiet, sit down, shut up. And they do it only because they're afraid of you. Until that point in time, they get bigger than you, and then they ain't afraid of you no more, and then they feel like they can do anything they want. Part of the reason so many of us have so many challenges in dealing with our children is because they're not saved. And Satan is stirring up in them all of their sinful fleshly desires. And you keep fighting against that in the flesh, and it doesn't seem to work because it won't work. And that's the reason why your focus should be on their salvation. Because when they are saved and the Holy Spirit indwells them, then the Holy Spirit, in cooperation with you, will help you to train them how to live a godly life. 
So corrective discipline is designed to break a strong, rebellious child whose will needs to be broken. But in such a way that you don't break the precious spirit that God has placed within that child. You want to discipline a child in a way that you correct them, but you help maintain their dignity and self-esteem. Not break them down to the point where they feel they can't do anything, say anything, do anything, be anything. Because you're just going to be hard on them. No, the balance is correct and discipline. Breaking that strong, rebellious will, but leaving them with the sense that they're still valued and loved by you. Discipline comes in a variety of forms, and depending on your children's personality, I can tell you what works for one may not work for another. Amen? For some children, the greatest discipline might include being sent to their room alone. For another child, however, that could be giving them a reward. Therefore, it is critical to understand and know your children so you can raise them up according to their individual personalities. Now, my father knew what worked for me, and because he did, he didn't have to discipline me much. And when he disciplined me, (laughs) it was done in such a way that I would never forget it. You see, (laughs) my dad called my discipline session. And then when I left Detroit and I went down to Tuskegee and I learned how some of the southern folk talked, they said, yeah, we used to call it straightening. You got to get some straightening. Yeah, okay, somebody knows what I'm talking about, right? Get some of that straightening, right? (laughs) Well, that's what he would call it, a session. And the way it worked is the sessions took place in our room. And what is worse than that, what he would do, he, he would send me into the room for a session. And then on top of that, he would make me wait. And I would wait. And that fear of what was about to happen would just build up in me, and I would just, Lord, why did you do what you did, boy? You know, you know he told you not to do that, right? Right? I knew what it was about to happen. And he wanted me to have plenty of time to think about whatever it was I had done to get myself in this mess. And then before my my dad started the session, he would start it out like this. Oh, by the way, get that belt over there. Now, are you ever going to do this again? No, Dad, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Are you ever going to do? And I would shout it out so that even the neighbors could hear, no, I was never going to do that again, right? And I meant it. Now, I want you to keep in mind something, folks. Disciplining your child is different from child abuse, all right? That's completely wrong, and that has nothing to do with love. Now, while discipline ought to produce some level of pain, whether you're removing games, reducing the amount of time they get to socialize with their friends, or on how much money they get to spend, putting your child to work on, you know, extra laborious uh, chores or some other rational form, understand it should be constructive pain designed to teach your child not to engage in sinful behavior again. The goal and discip- of discipline is always correction. You're trying to create obedience while maintaining your child's dignity and his esteem. Discipline is not yelling at your child. That's just venting. And it must be coupled with love or your child will not see it for the good you hope to gain through it. You will end up only provoking your child to anger because you're being angry yourself. Discipline must flow out of a heart of compassion for your child's well-being and his future. Just as we read in Hebrews concerning God. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Hebrews 12, 6. 
And another critical element in performing discipline that will establish kingdom, biblical, scriptural principles in your child is setting clear boundaries ahead of time. Disciplining your children for something that they did not realize was wrong or something that just irritated you will only bring about confusion and animosity in them, not spiritual growth. God always sets clear boundaries for us, and we should do the same with our own children. So when you teach your children that boundaries are the open door to freedom, they'll be more receptive to them, right? You can establish freedom by instructing your children that they are free to do what they want within the boundaries that you have provided. And as they continue to honor those boundaries, they earn more freedom. Now, let's you know, deal with our teenagers, for example. Right? Let's say they faithfully adhere to your 10 o'clock curfew. In time, you could reward them with what? More freedom. Move the curfew now maybe to 10, 30, 11. But this will teach them that rewards come by obeying boundaries. Parents, remember, it's okay to reward for obedience. God modeled this all throughout Scripture. Often his promises to the Israelites were dependent upon whether they obeyed his command. If they obeyed, they were blessed. Teach your children to obey with honor. This means that the child is not walking around with a scowl on his face talking about they're obeying you. That's not real obedience, folks. Where they've got a scowl on their face and they're making the whole atmosphere in the house Miserable for everybody. That's not real obedience. Let him know that that is not obedience until he or she fixes her face and gets her attitude straight. Amen? Amen. And along with the area of boundaries, parents must establish clearly defined expectations about what children are to do to contribute to the function of the home whether this means chores they perform, meals they prepare, or helping with their younger siblings. A healthy family atmosphere is one where there is clear communication about expectations, and in addition, parents, be consistent with the expectations you set. And then finally, we come to the area of instruction. Third pillar of parenting, instruction. As parents, we are to raise our children in the instruction of the Lord. We are to duplicate in them the same instruction that we receive from Jesus Christ. You can't communicate to them what you are not living out. If you don't know God's word, if you are not living uprightly before the Lord, if you are not making it a priority to give glory and honor to God with your life, you're not going to be able to transfer that to your children, and you shouldn't expect from them what you're not doing yourself. I apologize for stepping on some toes. You see, as believers in Jesus Christ, as his followers, we are to replicate his image on earth. We are his slaves. He is our master, according to Ephesians 6.6. 6. And the goal of discipleship is to reproduce the master Jesus Christ as completely and accurately as possible. And this is also the goal for instructing our children in the Lord. And in doing so, you are intentionally discipling them to embody and live out the message of their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You're teaching them the values of righteousness before God and justice among men, how to live lives that demonstrate equity Fairness, kindness, compassion, and love. That has to be instructed. It's not going to come automatically. And so when Paul talks to parents about this pillar of parenting, he clearly says that we are to bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. Not the hood. Not what your homeboy say and your sorrow said and your girlfriend said and, and what Oprah said and all of that. 
instruction in the Lord comes from the Word of God. Amen. Simply, however, instructing your children without including the truths and principle of God's Word may provide them with information, but it's not going to give them the wisdom to make the right choices in their life. You can be Let's take it to the street. We all know folks would say is real book smart, but when it comes to everyday life, no, they're not street wise. Well, the same thing can happen. You know, you can be real Bible and scripture smart, but your life doesn't match up with all you know in the Bible. That can happen. It's not about how much you know, it's how much you can apply and live out wisely. So, bringing up children in the instruction of the Lord, it requires time, folks, a substantial amount of it. You can't reach your children if you're not there or if you're too preoccupied when you are there that you never spend any time with them. Our nation is facing an ep epidemic of the destruction of the family, and it's due to the negligence of parents who are simply not available to instruct their children. The last few verses of the book of Malachi records a similar scenario. In Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, this is what the prophet says. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers Wait for it. So that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. The land would be saved when the father's hearts were once again turned towards home, indicating that when they are not turned home, the land suffers. Is that not what we're experiencing here in America? And in particular, within the black culture. Now, I understand schedules are busy, workloads are full. Church programs, they're important. Children are involved in sports. Look, the list goes on and on. Been there, done that. I know it. I understand it well. But we cannot ignore the supreme importance of instructing our children in the Lord until it's too late. And then they're out on their own. Don't fall into the enemy's trap thinking there will be time enough tomorrow when you're not so tired or you're finished with that important project or the holidays are over. Oh, these excuses, they sound familiar to you, huh? I guess I'm not the only one that's used them. So you all going to be quiet on me on that. I can't get an amen. Okay, thank you. Don't leave me hanging out there like that by myself. You see, the Bible tells us to ask God to teach us to number our days so that we will present to him a heart of wisdom. So as parents, we must seize the day. We've got to make it count. We've got to live it to the fullness, not allowing any opportunity to pass, to invest in the lives of our children. And trust me, I know they grow up a whole lot faster than you can ever imagine. One minute you're wrestling with them on the floor and you're picking them up and throwing them in the air and holding them in your arms. And then the next minute they're walking across the stage for graduation or you're giving them the way in marriage. And then it's too late. You know, we understand time's really tight, but the good news is that you can always teach your children while you go about your everyday life. In other words, you take the time to explain the truths of God's word to them just in your ordinary day-to-day -day activities. The ordinary day-to-day -day activities of living. As parents, we gotta learn to turn any situation into an opportunity to share a spiritual principle. Look for teachable moments by make yourselves available to them while you're doing what you're doing. 
when you're going out on an errand with them, being accessible to them at home, make every opportunity available to teach your children. We all have the same 24 hours a day, folks. Seizing the day doesn't mean merely having to do with the amount of time as much as prioritizing the time that you have. It means keeping first things first. And the fact is that we always make time for the things that are most important to us, whether we realize it or not. The activity that takes you away from your children may be a good thing in and of itself, but that is not the question. Your children are your primary responsibility, and they deserve your time. Example from the Bible where this was not done. If we go to Samuel, in the book of Samuel, Samuel was a prophet in the Old Testament, right? He's busy performing the work of God, but he lost his children because he spent so much time on the road, according to Samuel chapter 7, in Samuel chapter 8, you can read it there. Eli, the high priest, right? He ended up forfeiting his whole ministry and his very life he lost. Why? Because he ignored the responsibility of disciplining and instructing his sons. You can read that in First Samuel chapters 2 and 3. So what about your priorities and your schedule? Do you find yourself saying tomorrow a lot? Too often, when tomorrow comes, <laughs> the kids, they don't want to be around you anymore. Parents, forget tomorrow. You better seize today. Instructing your children in the Lord means spending time with them so they can see, not just hear, see how you live out the gospel. It means letting them see you praying and studying the Bible. It means involving them in any ministry in which you are engaged. By being with your children on a regular basis, in, on a normal everyday life activities, you can capitalize on teachable moments that present opportunities to mentor the faith of your child. Something as simple as looking at the night sky together can easily lead to a discussion about the creation and how God knows every star. But not only that, he knows the number of hairs on your head. <laughs> Playing games together can open topics of importance on things like integrity. No, you, you can't cheat like that. Got to play by the rules, right? Integrity, communication, focus. Watching a television show or movie together provides a natural conversation started for analysis of a character's motives, choices, actions, whether they are godly, whether they are wise and foolish, whether it is something that you should do or not do. In other words, practical application of the word of God to the everyday circumstances and situations in life. And at times, these teachable moments might be simple, while other times, they may be more graphic. And, you know, personally, I can remember one time sitting uh, on my parents' porch when, when I was a kid. This was back in the 67, during the riots. And um, during the riots, there were a lot of homes that were burning on our block. And there were a lot of looters and stuff. And we were watching to make sure that they weren't coming to our house, right? And I never will forget this. Some looters were coming towards our house. And these policemen came, tackled them, wrestled took them to the ground, put handcuffs on them. And I remember my mother and my father, they used that as an opportunity to say, son, if you break the law, it doesn't matter how mad you are how unfair the man is or the system is, you break the law, you're going to end up going to jail. Now, that made an impression on me because I knew I didn't want to go to jail. Practical application of biblical principle. It's a serious matter. So you don't always have to be sitting down formally with your children, having them sit up straight, right, for you to teach them. 
They can learn with you while you're cooking, you're driving, you're studying, and all, otherwise going about your day. The goal is not just sick shaping the way they think and believe. It's shaping the way they live. Instructing them in the Lord is not being as concerned about how much they know, but how much they can apply. How much of this can they live out? Instructing your children in the Lord ought to be done by immersing them in the Word of God through your lifestyle. And it's also important to intentionally create an atmosphere and give your children the freedom to ask questions. Because this provides the greatest opportunity for learning because they're going to ask you about the things that they're struggling with, the things that concern them the most. And when you take the time to invest to explain it to them based on the word of God, that's going to sink into them a whole lot quicker than what you keep trying to press upon them, that they not, may not be in a position to hear and understand at this time. So in conclusion, raising kids is not a task for the weary or the lazy. It is a full-time responsibility, but it also brings with it an eternity of rewards. It is an investment with great returns. And so as our world seeks to threaten and mislead our children in so many ways, it might be tempting for us to kind of surround them in a cocoon and, and never let them out of our sight. But we know that that doesn't work, right? But at those times when you feel overwhelmed at the size of your task, here's a verse that you can take comfort in regarding raising children. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, where it says, Trust in the Lord yes, sir. with all your heart, yes. and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. You, and ultimately, we must trust God with this endeavor of raising God-fearing christ following kids and as we seek him and we acknowledge him in all our ways he's going to guide us every step of the way in training our children our job is to give them what they need to make wise choices both while they are under our roof and then once they leave our home and if we have equipped them well and if we have done all we can while trusting god with the rest we will have done our job to the glory of God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you this morning that you have instructed us for your word regarding the three pillars of parenting. Encouragement, discipline, and instruction. Lord, we are not sufficient in ourselves to do these things. So we ask that you would empower us by the Holy Spirit to do all that we have heard this morning. It's daunting, Lord. It's challenging. And we call upon you to help us to do this for your glory. For this is what we ask and pray. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time... We'd like to offer an invitation. Would you please stand? Much of what I've talked about this morning is not going to be relevant to you unless you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ in the forgiveness of your sin and the salvation of your soul and the Lordship of your life, we welcome you to come right now and give yourself to the Lord and receive him as Lord and Savior. Is there any? Please come forward. We also would like to open up for the opportunity for anyone who has fallen away from the Lord, may have found themselves in a backslidden situation, are ready to come back. Recommit yourself to the Lord. We offer you that opportunity also. And if there's any, please come forward.
And finally, we want to open the doors of the church to anyone who is not a member. We'd love for you to become a member of the New Progress Missionary Baptist Church. As our pastor says, we're not a perfect church, but we endeavor to try to be all that God has called this church to be, and we would welcome you to come and join us in that effort. Is there anyone? Please come forward. You may be seated. At this time, we would like to offer to everyone the opportunity uh, to give. With the ushers, please come forward. Father in heaven, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the provision that you have made in our lives and for granting us the opportunity to give but a part of what you have given us to the work of your ministry. Bless these, your tithes, your offerings for the advance in your kingdom. For this is what we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
As we come to our benediction uh, this morning, there was uh, one other uh, notification we need to make, and I just want to make sure I got it correct. Uh, Sister McFadden, my understanding, you said you, you, there was a passing of a cousin. Yes. If you would uh, please keep her Amen. and her family in prayer. She's gotten, just gotten back down here. Now she's got to go right back up. Uh, so we will uh, keep you lifted up in prayer and let us do that right now. Father in heaven, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, on uh, behalf of Sister McFadden and her family in the passing of her cousin. And we lift up all who have lost loved ones here recently, Lord. We ask and pray that you would comfort them, that you would strengthen them, that you remind them uh, that they will be able to see those again in heaven, that that is our hope. And so let us continue to spread that hope to others during these perilous times. For this is what we ask and pray. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and everyone says, amen, amen. amen. So let us stand for the benediction. And now, may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. amen, amen. And amen. amen. All William Chorus members, please come up front for a few, just take one minute. And all deacons meet with Deacon Floyd. <laughs>